Um, this is Microsoft's uh, view on the world. Uh, this slide's a little bit older, but it still kind of shows you this, uh, how everything, remember I told you in the first section that there's a lot of products uh, at Microsoft that are .NET, part of the .NET family. This slide kind of shows how um, they all work together, even though every six months there's more joining, right? So this slide doesn't show you anything. It'll be all cluttered with everything. So in the back end here, of course, everything starts off at Windows Server, which is a new version coming out pretty soon. You know, for web programming, we have uh, ASP.NET, which is part of the, you know, the runtime of it is actually part of the server, because so you can service up uh, web pages. You have Windows Media to do all your media things. Uh, you have IIS, of course, which is the uh, you know program that does all the uh, web, all the web page um, applications you might have, but also all the service. Uh, web servicing applications you might have too are all uh, farmed out through IIS. And every version is different from the last, so uh, depending what version of um, uh, Windows Server you have. Of course, on the back end also, uh, we have SQL Server. Anybody here at work not using SQL Server? I also have Commerce Server and of course Office. You can use Office as a server application now with the new version of .NET. Um, before, it was really hokey to use on the server if you like, wanted to pre-gen Excel spreadsheets or Word documents and stuff like that. It was really a pain, but now you can actually use it uh, very uh, a lot easier than we have been, been before on the server. With the .NET and Visual Studio experience, if you want reach, not only in Windows, but Apple and uh, Safari, like I have on here, um, Firefox, IE, uh, Opera, things like that. And of course, uh, you probably will write, be writing applications that um, the newer way of doing applications in, in .NET uh, which is uh, using Silverlight, which is one of the newer things from .NET. The newer versions of Silverlight actually, uh, the, the first versions needed a browser, so it would work in any of those browsers, but now the, the new version doesn't need a browser anymore. You can actually run it out of browser uh, experience. So if you want reach, uh, you really need to stick with either Silverlight or um, just um, .NET web pages uh, using Ajax, which I used to do a class here on that. Uh, and, and Ajax is cool because it doesn't require an install like Silverlight does. And like one of the last times I did my conference talk on Ajax, uh, I found out that uh, it's a good thing to learn, uh, not only for just internal web pages, I use it at work and things like that, because it makes the user's experience much, much better than normal web pages uh, without using Silverlight. Uh, but like someone brought up in uh, uh, a conference talk I did, is that a lot of uh, companies, including the government, disallow Silverlight, Flash, and stuff like that on their uh, inside their company. Uh, so it's a good reason to use Ajax to get a better experience, because uh, uh, you know the government will take 10 years before they approve Silverlight, right? So if you want reach, that's really the two ways to go: uh, either Silverlight or um, web pages with Ajax. Uh, if you want a rich experience um, using Windows or Office or even IE. Then when you would use uh, Windows 7, hopefully those of you, uh, everybody has moved over to Windows 7 because Windows Vista sucked. So, and Windows XP is what, how old now? And on Windows 7, uh, we use uh, the Windows um, Presentation Foundation, which started with Vista, but is the brand new rendering engine that was designed for Vista and of course carried over to Windows 7. It's carried over to the Windows Mobile, the Windows Phone 7 and also is what Silverlight is based off. Silverlight, we'll talk more in, the, in that week, uh, Silverlight, its, its original code name was WPFE slash E, which meant uh, WPF everywhere. It, Silverlight is just a subset of WPF, which is the, the big uh, rendering engine that we have. The .NET framework timeline, in February 2002, .NET um, 1.0 came out. I was using it live in production with real customers in beta one of .NET. So that's how good it was even back then. And of course, Visual Studio.net, um, April 2003, we got that at 1.1, which wasn't a whole lot of changes, uh, but we got now some, um, the new security method that we uh, still use in .NET and uh, the Compact Framework, which is the uh, framework we use on the older mobile platforms. Uh, uh, handheld devices for, and I wrote a couple apps for that. In .NET 2, we got a lot of changes, including um, ASP.NET was a huge change, just like it changed this last version, really, really big. And also we got click once, which I, I talked a little bit about earlier, which is 
a way to distribute your application so they're auto updated. Remember 2006 is .NET 3. .NET 3 wasn't really .NET 3. To me, it was like .NET 2.1. They went up a whole nother version number for some reason because all it really included were the stuff that Vista needed. And uh, that was uh, WCF for communications, uh, WPF for a presentation, uh, WF uh, for workflow. 2007, we got uh, another big version, .NET 3.5 which uh, Ajax, which I talked a little bit about earlier, was built in as opposed to an add-on before. And of course, Visual Studio uh, 2008. August of 2008, uh, they released Service Pack 1, which actually to me should have been a version change because uh, there was huge changes in uh, Service Pack 1, the biggest I've ever seen. That included the Entity Framework, which uh, you guys get to hear a lot about because that's all I do at work pretty much nowadays. And I do all my con half my conference talks every year all about the Entity Framework, which is the new way to do data access. ASP.NET Dynamic Data, which is actually part of that. ADL.NET Data Services, which is part of the Entity Framework Services. New Silverlight SDK and Beta. Um, MVC, which is Model View Controller, new way to, to uh, serve up troll and, and serve up data, uh, came out in uh, 3.5. And of course, the ability to directly manipulate SQL Server 2008 came out in, in 3.52. So 3.5 Service Pack 1 uh, was a really big change. April 2010, the brand new version of .NET is this is truly brand new from the ground up. We got parallel extensions, which is now we can actually take direct advantage of multiple, uh, pro uh, multiple cores in your processor, which we could not do before in .NET. We have P-Link, which is part of parallel extensions. We'll talk a little bit about uh, direct support for Iron Ruby and Iron Python if code contract. .NET Framework is so big now that a lot of the teams in the .NET Framework can't wait around for a next release, update the code or make it better or whatever. So a lot of the teams that, uh, a few of the teams I know of at, at, at Microsoft, which I'll learn more about this when I'm actually up there at the end of this month, are now doing out of band releases meaning that, um, for, for, uh, for example, uh, probably before the service pack one for uh, Visual Studio, uh, .NET comes out, there's going to be a service pack for any of the framework itself. .NET 2.0 framework was actually used in .NET 3, .NET 3.5, still used the .NET 2 framework. Those two versions uh, past 2.0 just put stuff on top of 2.0. It wasn't like a whole new framework until .NET 4. That's really been the, the next big framework change was from .NET 4 from .NET 2. Let's talk about some of the things that came out in 2.0 because 2.0 was a significant change to .NET. So on the bottom here, we have the common language runtime and Visual Studio 2005 and our base class libraries, which we'll talk more about. In 2.0, we got C Sharp 2, uh, VB8, and a couple other language updates. And the new things we got in uh, 2.0 were major updates to ADO.NET, including direct access. I think it was in 2.0, we had a direct access to Oracle, which before had to go through a provider, but we have direct access from .NET into Oracle, which is much, much faster. Major improvements to uh, uh, Windows Forms. Click once came out. Major, major improvements to ASP.NET. It was a huge, huge change between uh, 1.1 and 2.0 in ASP.NET. And between 2.0 and 4, another huge change in ASP.NET to make a web programming much, much easier. In 3.0, you're going to see not, not a lot changes. We still have the same language versions, WPF, Windows Presentation Foundation, so work in Vista. Uh, also Workflow, WCF, which is the new way we do all of our uh, remoting remoting data communications in .NET through WCF one way or the other now. That's what came out in 3.0. 3.5, we got major improvements uh, to Ajax. Ajax was actually built, not only made better, but built into the framework where before it was just a, an add-on. Silverlight came out in 3.5. We also uh, had some improvements to WCF, which includes REST, which is the uh, actually one of the talks I do this year at conferences and actually uh, what my whole big project at work is based off of is the REST communication, uh, which is the new way most people are doing communication across the wire now is through REST. And Microsoft's flavor of REST is called OData. So if you hear OData, that's Microsoft's take on REST. We got linked to SQL, uh, which quickly died in eight months, which is a really easy way to model to make uh, an object model on top of SQL Server, period. We got a new version, C Sharp 3 and VB9. So we got a lot of language enhancements in 2.5 and generics and, and lots of really cool things that we still use now. 
extensively. Entity Framework back then was an add-on. A lot of new features for ASP.NET and AJAX, but not as much between 1.1 and ASP.NET and 2.0. Updates to WCF, uh, which included WS Star, uh, JSON, REST, syndication, POX, and all those kind of things. Workflow and AJAX integration better with WCF. So Service Pack 1, so we got any framework built in. With any framework, we got something called Data Services, which allows you, allows you to literally one line of code expose your data through REST. Dynamic data, which is part of the any framework stuff, AJAX browser history. We have got some partial trust things and stuff like that in WCF. Uh, lots of ADO.NET enhancements for uh, 2008 any framework. Uh, data services, click one's branding, .NET um, client profile. So one of the problems with .NET that we experience at work, .NET framework is a huge install, very big, and people don't like installing it before and waiting for it to install, you know, before they can run their app. And uh, even though all the newer versions of Windows comes with the framework on it, almost guarantee you it's not the one you're using. <laughs> so you have to go through the install. The install contains everything, server side code, client side code, all the communication, everything in that big framework. But that's what people complained about. Either, even if it was on a DVD or you can automatically install it from Microsoft if your program requires it, right? And that took a while. You know, users don't like to wait, right? What do they do when they wait? Start clicking and doing stupid things. And right? remember, users are four letter word. With the client profile, you can actually, if you program it correctly, you can actually uh, just do one little checkbox in your, your program setup, and that basically denotes that your client uses a subset, which is basically just the client subset of the .NET framework, which means none of the server stuff and things like that, right? <laughs> So then you can, now there's two installs, right? There's the client profile install for the .NET framework, which is much smaller than the whole monster. So you can do that in your client side now, is just install the client side pieces for the framework and not the server stuff. It makes your user experience a lot better. So 4.0 was a huge change. So like I said before, .NET 3 just sat on the top of .NET 2. .NET 3.5 sat on top of .NET 3 and 2. And done at Service Pack 1, 3.5 sat on top of 3.5 and 3 and 2. With 3.5, we were able to multi target applications from Visual Studio, meaning that in Visual Studio 2008, I could write a .NET 2 application, a .NET 3 application, or a .NET 3.5 application, right? Because they all were basically sitting on top of the same framework. You could do multi targeting. Um, you didn't have to install a whole separate version of .NET just to target those different frameworks. So 4.0 is a brand new framework. Everything is brand new in 4.0. We have C-sharp 4, VB10, F-sharp, and some new things coming down the line like a, and the M language and stuff like that. Um, so brand new versions of all that. F-sharp, it's the first version of F-sharp. Uh, Visual Studio 2010. We had major improvements to any framework. So any framework is greatly improved, and we also got built-in uh, data services. Then we got better MVC, model view controller, uh, huge changes to AJAX. AJAX is actually open source now. Huge changes to ASP.NET uh, in uh, 4.0. It's like a whole new thing in 4.0. Just like from, from 1.1 to 2, it was almost brand new, and now from 2 to 4, it's almost brand new. Port for Dublin, which is the new Windows server, if you guys have heard about that. That's the code name for the new Windows Server. Workflow was basically completely rewritten. Workflow worked like any other first version of something in .NET. Uh, they decided they needed to trash it and start over again. So uh, they did, it's a lot better now. Much, much better, and based on XML. Got some brand new security. So we got uh, something called WIF, uh, Windows Identity Foundation, which is a really awesome way to do security now. Much, much better. 4.0, we got the new version of Visual Studio, which, uh, by the way, was rewritten all in WPF. Uh, so most of Visual Studio now is written in .NET and uses WPF. So we get a lot of really cool features we haven't had before. Uh, brand new language versions on F-sharp. Um, huge base class library improvements, including extensibility, which is one thing I really like, and I spend a lot of time writing these things. Parallel computing. Those of you who know how processors work, right? 
Um, you know, uh, Windows and or Intel have been faking multiprocessors for a while now. You know, five years ago, you could look and there'd be two different graphs going on. And go, what the hell is that? It was just faking it. It was hyper-threading or something like that. Now, almost every computer you buy actually has multi-core cores on it, right? That has got a two-core. Most new machines all have four cores on it, things like that. So now we have true multiprocessing on our processor. But in .NET, we never were able to target that. Yes, the processor will farm it out on the different cores for you, but a lot of times not near as efficiently as you can if you know what you're doing. Last year when I was at Microsoft, I saw this really cool ray tracing demo that with one processor and then one core and then two cores and three cores and four cores, you wouldn't believe how fast that sped up. So when you're doing complicated renderings, uh, like I know some of my uh, friends that write stuff up in technology do uh, with WPF, it, dramatically speeds things up if you can move that work off into different cores. And uh, so it's really, really good for visual things. Uh, the other thing, uh, parallel computing is really, really good for is number crunching. To get, get your number crunching off into different cores and have it all come to back, back together at the end. So to me, that's one of the huge, huge improvements in .NET is we can actually take advantage of uh, multi-cores now. Like I said, huge changes in ASP.NET, AJAX, any framework, WCF data services, I think we talked all about that. A lot more testability built into the Visual Studio family now, uh, which we didn't have. It's always been getting better and getting better, but now we can do really, some really cool things on testability in uh, uh, .NET and Windows Identity uh, Foundation. Parallel computing. Uh, with parallel computing, we have the new parallel task library, the task parallel library. Really, really simple, simplifies multi-threading. Not only doing the different cores, but doing multi-threading. You can do expressions or list of works expressions, automatic thread pulling and notifications. Uh, even with the link, which we'll talk about <coughs> later, uh, you basically just do one little extra thing at the end of your link call and it automatically parallels it and doesn't multi-thread it. You don't do any work, really. So it's a lot easier to do um, asynchronous delegates, worker threads, all these kind of things, much, much better. Uh, still requires uh, .NET synchronization code, and of course, parallel link library. So architecture, the common language infrastructure is a language neutral platform for application development and execution. Like I said before, the, this is a lot, the CLR is really a lot uh, part of this, is the common language infrastructure and, and the CTS. Assembly, so every unit Every, anything that get executed in .NET is what we call an assembly. So every EXE or DLL you create in .NET is an assembly. We don't call them a DLLs or EXEs, we just call them assemblies. They're kind of a generic name for everything in .NET. Uh, and that's what's used to, you know, not only execute, but, you know, give to your customers, and, and that's how security is applied and all these kind of things. Everything revolves around the assembly we'll talk more about. Um, metadata, all assemblies have metadata inside of it, whether that be just strings or graphics or things like that. All assemblies have some sort of metadata connected to it. Security, so all security is applied on an assembly. The class libraries, this is really the base class libraries, which I said earlier, that this is where we have just tens of hundreds of thousands, I don't know how many classes that are pre-written, uh, code, code classes that are pre-written for you, so you don't have to do it like connecting to databases and, and going across the wire and, and doing graphics and doing 3D graphics and things like that. It's all built for you. You don't have to write any of the stuff anymore. You just glue it together. And of course, memory management. A lot of interviews I go through, people don't even understand. And I was, a couple weeks ago, I was, I was interviewing senior level developers and they could not explain to me how memory management works. Memory management is a big deal and especially understanding it. So one of .NET's big goals was to unify all the cool stuff in programming up until that time. Everything in Windows, especially those of you who programmed in Windows before, everything starts out in the Windows API. Everything that you see on the screen or that's done in Windows comes from the API one way or the other. In the old days, we would have to talk directly to that. And that's why I said earlier, it's the, one of the most dangerous things you can do because you will literally blue screen your machine if you don't do it right. It's harder to do this, way hard to do this in .NET now, but in other languages, it's very, very simple. So they took the Windows API, which you have to. I mean, there's no way to do Windows without the Windows API. Uh, and they took the rad um, development of VB Forms, because VB was the fastest way to write an application UI. They also took the power uh, subclassing and expressiveness of uh, MFC and ATL, which is part of C++. 
They took the stateless code embedded HTML pages of ASP. AS ASP.NET is so superior to ASP. Uh, it's not even funny, but they took that idea. And actually a lot of the ideas from ASP and ASP.NET, they're now applying to all the new Microsoft uh, uh, framework features like uh, WPF and the new WF and all those things. They are using things, they architecture they stole from ASP and ASP.NET, which created the .NET framework. The last time I did this slide or could uh, find out, there's actually 60 .NET languages. And there they all are. And uh, so no matter what background you come from, you can write in .NET because there's a COBOL.NET and a Pascal.NET and uh, all of these other things. I don't know why you would write anything in Pascal.NET, but it exists. <laughs> the only ones Microsoft support are the ones out of the box. All the other ones are written by third party companies. I have to show you the obligatory hello world. That's it. <laughs> that will compile to an EXE and run in .NET. That's all you need. We're, we're using a namespace here. We'll talk about that later. Here's my class. Here's my void, which is a startup for console applications. Yes, we have console applications in .NET. Startup for a console application, the public static void main. And we're writing out to the console window, hello world. That's it, yes, that sir. will compile. Of course, Microsoft wants you to use Visual Studio .NET, but literally you can write .NET in Notepad. So this is a fully integrated development environment because literally Microsoft has made it so you never need to leave Visual Studio for almost everything, including writing databases and store procedures and, and, and doing office stuff and things. You never need to leave Visual Studio. They want to keep you there. And they've done a really good job at doing that. Yeah, there's little things I'm gonna have to go into SQL Server and do for like security and things like that. But my most 99% of my work, I never even need to go into SQL Server. The framework itself is actually a completely free SDK. It's completely free, completely redistributable, redistributable any way you want it. You can download it, you can install it, you never need Visual Studio. This is how you write .NET and Notepad. Of course, we have the redistributable, which is redistributable, which is completely free too. So you can freely redistribute your apps to anybody who wants them. You don't have to pay for anything, you don't have to license anything, nothing like that. Um, there are free versions on the net, which they call the express versions, including SQL Server. You can do up to a four, or they might have changed it now to eight gigabyte database, completely free. Uh, the next thing is if you're a student, even a student here, you can get the pro version for free, dreamspark.com. And uh, uh, what they do is uh, you need a EDU address, but if you just like fax them or something, your enrollment form here, they will give you the version for free. So dreamspark.com is the, the place to do that. And if you're a business, a small business, you can actually get it for free too by going to bizspark.com. And there are some rules on getting all that free stuff, but you basically get, I don't know for the student version, but for the think, I'm pretty sure for the business version, you get the lowest level MSD subscription for free. So there's almost no way you cannot get this for free.